Hello and welcome to the JSA Studio. I am your host, as always, Nathan, and today I'm coming at you with another prediction video for the Big Ten. This week we're going to be going through the Week 9 games. But before we get into predicting each game, I am going to go ahead and ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. If you did, it would really help out the channel. And now with the intro done and out of the way, there's only one thing left to do, and that is to get started by starting with Rutgers at USC. These are two teams that have been thoroughly disappointing to me at a personal level the past few weeks. I thought Rutgers had a shot to win last week. Obviously, they didn't. I predicted USC to beat Maryland. I also predicted USC to beat Minnesota. Obviously, they didn't. These are two wildly disappointing teams, in my opinion. And I don't know what to do about that. Genuinely, I'm not sure how to predict this game, really. USC is a 13.5 point favorite. The over-under is fairly high at 56.5. This game is probably going to come down to Rutgers' ability to run the football. And they probably will be able to run the football. USC's run defense is absolutely atrocious. They made Michigan look like a competent offense. That's how bad that defense has been this year. However, I still maintain that I think D'Anthony Lynn is a very good football coach as the defensive coordinator, and I think he's going to ultimately get this team into a position where they can at least play competent defense. It is not going to be this year. Uh, heading into this year, I didn't think it was going to be this year. Uh, however, early on in the season, they honestly did show some progress, uh, and then the wheels kind of fell off. As far as Rutgers goes, if they can get a consistent run game, which is something they've struggled with the past few weeks, then the offense should be good enough to put some points up on the board. However, the thing that I haven't really been taking into account until these past few weeks here is the fact that you now have teams in the Big Ten that have to take you know, five or six hour long flights every week. I think there's a reason why Penn State struggled when they played USC on the road. I think there's also a reason why USC looked significantly better offensively in that game. It's because they didn't have to travel. And that might be a bigger hurdle than a lot of people realize for these teams. Like, USC going to Iowa, that's not that big of a deal because they had to fly to Washington. That's kind of the same sort of length. It's a little bit longer to go to Iowa, I understand that. But going from Southern California all the way up to the edge of the country, effectively, that's a relatively normal travel trip. So them going to play Nebraska, them going to play Iowa, probably not as big of a deal. Them going to play all the way in New Jersey, going quite possibly the furthest that you can go in like a direct flight in this entire country, yeah, that's not gonna be great for either team making that trip, and that includes Rutgers. Now, you can make a case that maybe USC, because they've had to do it several times this year, would have a kind of advantage doing that, and that Rutgers wouldn't because they haven't done it yet. However, I, I don't particularly think it's something that is going to ever become an advantageous thing. I think it's just going to be a disadvantage for the traveling team. And the fact of the matter is, is that Rutgers is, in fact, the traveling team this week. I have this game predicted at USC 34 and Rutgers 17. I think when it comes down to it, USC has looked much better at home than on the road. I do think Rutgers is going to have some layover in terms of traveling, you know, six-hour flight or a five-hour flight or however long the flight is. I don't remember. It doesn't particularly matter to me all that much. It's a horribly long flight. They're going to come in, and then they got to turn around and play in not their time zone. So this is not a great game for Rutgers. 
I mean, I know that they say a run game travels, but Rutgers' run game hasn't traveled this year. So I just think everything about this says USC is going to win. However, I'm always wrong when I pick USC to win. So if you're a Rutgers fan, maybe that's a good thing. Up next, a game that was hyped up beyond belief in both the preseason and the early season when Nebraska was ranked uh, before they lost to Illinois. And this game was hyped up as a potential sneaky game for Ohio State. Oh, Nebraska, who knows? They're a good football team. You know, I'm not sure about that. But also, Ohio State was always coming off of a bye. This was not a trap game. If Ohio State had played Oregon last week, as opposed to having the bye last week and then playing Oregon the week before that, then maybe you could start talking about this as a trap game if they beat Oregon in like a close game on the road, okay? This isn't a trap game. Ohio State's going to come out and they're going to make a statement. I understand that they've got a new left tackle in. Nebraska does not have the pieces to exploit that weakness, in my opinion. I don't think their edge rushers are very good. Interiorly, I think they've got some NFL caliber type of guys, or at least some guys that have that sort of potential. However, on the exterior of that defensive line, they are not there, at least yet. I, I don't know what their recruiting looks like. I don't particularly follow recruiting all that close. Also, I just don't think Nebraska's all that good. I, I think they were getting remarkably overhyped, and I had always kind of talked about, hey, I don't know if this is the year for them. Next year could be the year for them. They're going to have to go out into the transfer portal, and they're going to have to get some wide receivers. They're going to have to replace a little bit on defense. However, this is not a team that I was particularly confident in in terms of contending for the Big Ten this year. And guess what? They're not doing that. They got demolished by Indiana. And unfortunately, if you're a Nebraska fan, you've also got Ohio State coming off of a very close loss with a lot of controversy in it. Okay, this has statement game for Ohio State written all over it. A, I think it's a bad matchup for Nebraska to begin with from a football perspective. The line is set at 25 and a half, which is a weird number for the line to be at. If you think about it, 25 and a half is kind of a weird number. Uh, the over under is 48 and a half. So this is not a game that Vegas thinks is going to be close, and I am inclined to agree with that. I don't believe this is going to be a close game. I think Ohio State is going to come out. I think Jeremiah Smith is going to get targeted a lot more than he has been getting targeted. I think that's something that they're going to focus in on during the bye week is getting him more involved in the offense. Yes, Emeka Buka is good. Yes, you have other options. None of them are as good as Emeka Buka, and Emeka Buka is not nearly as good as Jeremiah Smith. I actually think your wide receiving core at this point is kind of becoming overrated. Carnell Tate is very clearly a whiff of a five-star prospect. He's just not that good. He's in your third year in the program, and he's barely starting. But that's fine. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you miss on prospects. It's all good. It's no big deal. You'll, you've probably got some five-star freshman wide receiver that's going to come in this year and take his spot and be phenomenal. It doesn't matter to me all that much uh this team is not something that i'm worried about really when it comes to the wide receiver position i'm not worried about ohio state all that much uh, and i'm not worried about the team in general i i do think that they have a tougher back half of the schedule than people want to talk about from this oregon game until the second to last game of the season because the michigan game is not a tough game you're going to win that game if you score a point you're going to win that game so that one doesn't matter as much as it has in years past. All that being said, I think this is going to be a blowout. I think this is a statement game for Ohio State. I think Ohio State comes out against Nebraska, which is a team for some reason that a lot of people still have uh, uh, you know, as like a borderline rankable team. And for some reason, a lot of the computer models still really think Nebraska is a top 30 team in the country. They are not a top 30 team in the country. They aren't. It's a fact of reality. Uh, Ohio State might be the best team in the country. And I think they are unequivocally better than Indiana from a talent perspective and maybe from a pure coaching perspective as well. So this 
has just utter decimation written all over it to me. Nebraska got destroyed by Indiana last week, and this week I think they're going to get destroyed by Ohio State. I have this as a 42 points for Ohio State, three points for Nebraska kind of game. I think this is a game that Dylan Raiola is going to struggle in. I think the defense for Ohio State, although overrated from preseason expectations, is still a top 10 unit in college football. And Dylan Raiola has not seen anything like that quality of defense this season. I think we might start to understand how young Dylan Raiola is in this game. I think he's going to end up making a lot of freshman, young player, young quarterback kind of mistakes. And I think it's going to be a real, real Herculean task for Nebraska to win this game. I just don't see it happening. Moving on to the next game here, Washington at Indiana. And I'm going to lead with the line on this one here. Indiana minus six and a half. Over under set at 53 and a half. Don't so much care about that. Indiana minus six and a half. That is such a concerning line if you're an Indiana fan. That is really, really weird. Indiana should be 20-point favorites in this game. That's what pretty much every computer model except FPI says that this should be about it. S&P Plus has Indiana as a significantly better team. College Football Nerds has Indiana as a significantly better team. What the fuck does Vegas know that we don't know? Genuinely, I've got a, I've got a question. Like, what is in the field in Bloomington, Indiana, that I don't know about that's going to have Washington play out of their mind to even make this a seven-point game? I don't know. I think Washington offensively is a bunch of empty calories. I think they put up yards and they don't put up points. That's what I mean by that. Defensively, I think their front seven is actually pretty good. I think they're an above average borderline good kind of front seven and the back half is is bad. And the fact of the matter is Indiana plays consistent, high quality football. They've got a great offensive line to deal with the front seven. The defense does have question marks. But the offense is incredibly efficient. It's not necessarily explosive in the traditional sense, like the Big 12 circa early 2010s sort of explosive offense. They're not that. But they do get chunk plays consistently in every single game that they've played so far. So I really, really struggle to see how this could be a six and a half point line. Genuinely, I I don't understand it. Like, I get that they think that Washington can score points, but they can't. Like, genuinely, they've put up a lot of yards. They haven't put up a lot of points in pretty much any game. I mean, Michigan gifted them 10 points, and they barely got to 20. Like, they scored, what did they score, 27 points? Like, and Michigan gave them 10 points. If Michigan didn't turn the ball over, Washington scores 17 points against a defense that honestly isn't very good in Michigan's defense. So with all of my struggles with the line in this game, there's just a very real possibility that this Vegas knows shit that we don't know because that's happened several times this season, including Washington. A lot of people don't remember this. Washington was an underdog when they went to Rutgers, and everyone looked at that, and they were like, what the fuck? What was that about? I looked at that, and I talked about it. I didn't understand that. I picked Washington to win that game. Turns out, Vegas knew something we didn't know. And that kind of feels like this game. If Washington was favored in this game, or if it was a two- or three-point spread, where they think that Washington and Indiana would be uh, you know, a pick on a neutral field, that's what a two- or three-point spread for a home team would likely mean. If that was the case, then I would predict Washington to win the game. But that isn't the case, and I'm not going to predict Washington to win the game. I just really struggle with how good Indiana has been and how inconsistent and honestly bad at times Washington has been this season to pick Washington to keep this game close even. 
Uh, I've got the score Washington 17, Indiana 41. I think Indiana has quite genuinely a top five offense in all of college football. I don't see any scenario where Washington's going to be able to slow them down. Speaking of lines, I don't get. I just went on that whole tirade with Indiana and Washington there. This is another line I don't get. I don't know how the fuck Iowa can be 13 and a half point favorites over any team in the entire goddamn country. Their offense is horrible the second they play a defense ranked above 80th in the country. They turn the ball over. And if you have gap integrity on defense, they don't particularly run the ball very well either. Again, this is not a good football team. I've been on this train the whole year. I don't think Iowa is a good football team. And Northwestern, say what you want to about Northwestern, they are a well-coached football team that will not beat themselves. I do th- agree with the over-under at 37.5. This will be a low-scoring game in which both teams will struggle to get to 20 points. However, I think Iowa's defense is overrated. I think Northwestern's defense is underrated. I think Iowa is just flat out and straight up bad offensively, just as bad as they have been the past few years. It's just that they have a running back that can break open a play when he gets to the second level, which is not something they've had the past few years. So people think the offense is better when the offense is not better. I get that it's at home with Iowa. However, I don't think that's going to matter as much to a team like Northwestern, who has won these type of Big Ten West old school sort of games a lot. And yes, Iowa wins those games more consistently than Northwestern, but Northwestern, you can't keep them out of the conversation because of that. This is a well-coached football team in Northwestern, and I'm not positive Iowa is a well-coached football team. I think they are defensively. I just don't think they have the talent that they've had the past few seasons. Offensively, it's honestly impressive how poorly they they are coached. Like we're getting to almost Michigan levels of offensive ineptitude with Iowa. Almost. Not quite there, but almost. This game right here is my upset special of the week here. I've got Northwestern 17, Iowa 14. I think Northwestern is going to come out here with a win. Now, when I've picked against Iowa, Iowa's won usually. However, Northwestern, I've been pretty accurate on so far this year. And I think I've got a good feel for Northwestern for the most part. Iowa is not Wisconsin. They don't have the talent. They don't have the coaching. However, Wisconsin also has a competent offense, which is not something Iowa has. And Northwestern kept them to 23 points. Now, Northwestern also scored three points. However, the past few weeks, post the USC game, Wisconsin's defense has been better than Iowa's defense. So I think there's a very real possibility that Northwestern is playing a significantly worse offense and a slightly worse defense than they were playing last week. I think there's a possibility that Northwestern just flat out and straight up wins this game outright. And that's what I'm going to predict. Uh, You can call me biased against Iowa. I'm perfectly willing to wear that badge. I don't think this is a good football team. Genuinely. I don't think this is a good football team. Now, they don't have a difficult schedule the rest of the way, so they might end up winning eight games. But I do not be surprised that this game is significantly closer than what the line would indicate it be. Next game up here, Maryland at Minnesota. Minnesota is a three and a half point favorite on a neutral field, there's a very real possibility that this game is a pick 'em. Over under is 46 and a half. Minnesota has been better than their record indicates. They should have beaten UNC, and if this team is five and two instead of four and three, I think there's a different narrative about the Minnesota season right now. Same thing with Maryland. They might be better than I'm giving them credit for. If this game was at home, I think Maryland would be favored by, relatively speaking, the same margin that Minnesota is. I think it might end up being two and a half or three instead of three and a half. However, this game is in Minnesota. So I do think that 
that matters, especially in a game like this where neither team has the over talent to just overpower the other team. This is going to come down to the little things and the game plans early and the adjustments made at halftime. So basically, this is going to come down to the coaching staffs. This is a very, very close matchup in my mind. So close, in fact, that even though I am predicting Minnesota to win 21 to 20, I would not be surprised if Maryland won this game at all. I do think this is going to be a close game. And I got to be honest with you, I don't particularly have a reason why I think Minnesota is going to win this game. I'm just going to give it to the home team. If Maryland was at home, I'd probably give it the same score, but flipped. But Maryland isn't at home, so I'm going to predict Minnesota to win. And Minnesota, I did mention the the UNC game, but they probably should have beaten Michigan too. If that onside kick is called correctly, which it should have been, then this is potentially a 6-1 and football team if they can make a field goal at the end of the UNC team and if the refs didn't job them out of a W. Then this is a 6-1 and and probably ranked Minnesota team. This is a quality football team. And Maryland, the past few weeks, have kind of turned their season around. You know, Loxley is, in fact, coaching for his job, and a win here would help him out tremendously in that endeavor. A loss is not a nail in the coffin for Maryland, in my opinion. However, I do think that this game does have some potential to sway the narrative of how both of these seasons for these teams are going. And I am going to predict Minnesota to win that game. Next one on the docket, we have the only ranked matchup in the Big Ten this week. Number 20, Illinois at number one, Oregon. Uh, Oregon is a 21 and a half point favorite. The over under is set at 54 and a half. I have been consistently higher on Illinois this season than the average person. I been talking about for weeks about how they were going to beat Michigan and then I got cold feet the week of because everybody was picking Michigan to win that game should have stuck to my guns I thought Illinois had a real real good chance to beat Nebraska and they beat Nebraska I think Illinois has a very very good chance to end the season at 10 and 2 and be a ranked football team now there's a reason I said 10 and 2 and not 11 and 1 because you think if I would want them to win the game, I would say 11 and one, have a shot at making the playoffs and being in potentially the Big Ten championship game. I don't think that. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the score real quick. I do have this game closer than the line, so I think Illinois is going to cover. Uh, but I've got this score, Illinois 21, Oregon 35. The fact of the matter is that Illinois does have an NFL caliber quarterback. Is he going to go in the first round? No. Is he going to get drafted? I would lean towards Yes. Talking about Luke Altmeyer here. They've got two NFL caliber wide receivers again. Are they going to go high? Probably not. They're both probably day three picks. However, this is a team that has some serious NFL talent on it. Legitimate NFL draft picks. Oregon has like 20 kids that are going to get drafted in the next two years, if not more. Okay. The talent level is just different. Oregon is a well-coached football team, and so is Illinois. However, They've got more talent. They have a better quarterback. They have better wide receivers. They have more talent on defense. I don't think this is going to be a game where Oregon comes out and blows them out of the water. However, I do think that this is a game that Oregon wins relatively easily. This could end up being the type of game where it's uh, 14 to 35 with five minutes left in the fourth quarter. Illinois goes on a little three or four minute drive because Oregon defensively is just trying to burn a clock. And then they end up scoring a touchdown. It's 21, 35. And then Oregon can run the clock out on their next offensive series. That is kind of what this game might look like to me. I do think Illinois will put up a bit of a fight, but they're just clearly in two different weight classes right now. Second to last game here that we're going to talk about today, Penn State at Wisconsin. This is a game that a lot of people are pointing at and saying, like, "Mm, this is a sneaky game. Penn State better watch out. Are they looking ahead? Are they looking ahead? You know, I don't don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking that Penn State might be looking ahead to Ohio State next week. Um, I don't believe that is the case. I think Penn State understands the gravity of this game. 
because this game, far more than the Ohio State game, defines this Penn State season. They're not beating Ohio State. I think everybody kind of knows that. They're not beating Ohio State. James Franklin is incapable of beating Ohio State when they don't block a kick and run it back for a touchdown. This game is the game that decides Penn State's season. If they win this game, they're probably going to go 11-1, and and depending upon what happens with other teams, they may luck their way into the Big Ten championship game. All that being said, Wisconsin, also kind of sneakily, only has one loss in the Big Ten, somewhat ironically to a USC team who uh, at home beat Wisconsin and at home almost beat Penn State. So potentially you could look at that as like a point of comparison between these two teams and be like, oh, Penn State beat USC on the road. Wisconsin lost by 17 points on the road. So maybe Penn State is like a 20-ish point team better than Wisconsin. You could make that argument. It'd be a bad argument, quite frankly, mainly because Wisconsin is a different football team than when they played USC. That was the game where Luke Fickle looked himself in the mirror and said, all right, time to stop fucking around. We're going to go and take care of business. And that's what they've done the past few weeks. They just beat everybody, and convincingly. They haven't had a close game. And Penn State, they've kind of struggled. They're, they're a very inconsistent offense. The defense is not the caliber it has been the past few years with Manny Diaz, who, by the way, is doing a phenomenal job at Duke as the head coach. But when he was the defensive coordinator, this was a top three defense in the country. This isn't a top three defense. It's probably top 20. But they very clearly are not the same caliber that they have been the past few seasons. This, from a Wisconsin perspective, also has program building win kind of written all over it. Penn State looking ahead to Ohio State next week. Penn State also remarkably inconsistent, especially offensively. Maybe they get down for too long in this game. Wisconsin's been running the football. They've been doing enough in the past game so that teams can't put nine people in the box. So this is potentially a matchup where Wisconsin does have a lot going for it. However, when it comes down to it, I want to believe in this Penn State team. I want to believe that this year is going to be different. Now, I already said they're not going to beat Ohio State next week. So spoilers for video next Friday, but they're not beating Ohio State. I'm not going to predict them to beat Ohio State. So for me and this Penn State team, this is the game that defines their season. This is the game where you look at it and you say, if Penn State can win this game, they're going to have a successful season. That's pretty much it, because you make the playoff, it's a success. Penn State, 27, Wisconsin, 21. I do think it is going to be close. However, I also believe that Penn State just has too much offensively and defensively compared to Wisconsin for Wisconsin to pull off the W. The last game of the week, the last game I'm going to be talking about today, the battle for Paul Bunyan. Michigan State, Michigan, in Ann Arbor, night game kickoff, bringing back memories of the early 2010. Oh, wait, it's on the Big Ten Network. Both of these teams are four and three and kind of suck. Well, at least it's still a rivalry game. At least the best trophy in college football, in my opinion, is still up for grabs. So this game does mean something for one team. It means nothing for the other team. And instead of going in and analyzing this game and then giving you my opinion on who's going to win, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the score, and then I'm going to talk about what I think is going to happen in this game. I've got this game as Michigan State 34, Michigan 6. I do not believe this is going to be a close game. I think halfway through the second quarter, you're going to see Michigan fans leaving the big house. I think this is a team in Michigan State that is turning the corner. I think they turned the corner last week, or at least started to. This week, if the team that beat Iowa shows up to play Michigan, they're going to win this game in convincing fashion. 
if Childs can throw less than two interceptions, they're going to win this game in convincing fashion. Because Childs has legitimate first-round pick type upside at the quarterback position. Michigan doesn't have anything like that on offense. And defensively, Michigan, even though they do have maybe four first-round picks in this next upcoming draft, defensively, they don't play cohesively as a unit. And even though individually they're all playing well, they're not all playing well at the same time, and they're not all doing the things that they were doing last year. Top to bottom, right now, who is a more talented roster, Michigan State or Michigan? The answer is not Michigan. Michigan has one five-star player in this roster and a bunch of four-stars, okay? I get it. Michigan has multiple first-round picks. Cool. Outside of that, what do they have? The answer is fuck all. Top to bottom, Michigan State is a more talented football team than Michigan right now. Genuinely. Adrian Brantley at corner is going to get talked about in the first round. Michigan State, defensively, this entire season has been better than Michigan defensively. And offensively, even though Michigan State turns the ball over a whole lot, they've been able to get chunk plays. They've been able to move the ball. So that doesn't matter. That fact that they turned the ball over hasn't particularly mattered. Like, oh, you turned the ball over against Ohio State. You weren't going to beat Ohio State. You threw three interceptions, but you still managed to beat Maryland. Also, this team has significantly overachieved. Now, I will say this. My preseason prediction was for Michigan State to look exactly like this. Almost exactly. I said offensively, you've got the potential to be explosive. Don't know what Adrian Childs might look like. Defensively, if you can be all right, then this is a team that might win seven or eight games. And that's what you're on pace to do. You're going to win this game. This is the most important game for Jonathan Smith in the history of his coaching. Far more important than beating Oregon, I guess, two years ago now. And any game that they played last year, even though they were a significantly better team at Oregon State than Michigan State is this year. Okay, None of that matters. This is the most important game in Jonathan Smith's career coaching. At least as a head coach, I should say. I don't know where he's been as a coordinator or position coach or quality control coach or whatever the fuck he was doing before he became a head coach. Okay, This game is going to decide how this season is perceived for the Michigan State fan base. You beat Michigan, successful season. You don't beat Michigan, okay, you better beat Michigan next year. Because if he goes 0-2, there are going to be some real serious conversations surrounding Jonathan Smith. If you go 1-1, one and one, even if you lose next year, which maybe you will, maybe you won't, I'm more inclined to believe that you're going to be a better football team than Michigan next year. However, things can change. Either way, uh, kind of getting off trap talking about the future of Michigan State and, and Michigan and all of that, okay? When it comes to this game, I fully expect Michigan State to win in convincing fashion. I think defensively, Michigan State is going to be motivated. I think defensively, they can do everything that will limit Michigan to less than 10 points. I think Michigan's offense is severely and unbelievably inept in every conceivable way that I flat out and straight up do not think Michigan has a pathway to victory in this game. However, if you go by the computer models, Michigan has a 76.6% chance of winning, according to FPI, and College Football Nerds has this game at Michigan State 16, Michigan 22. Let me make this very clear. There is no fucking chance in hell unless Adrian Childs turns the ball over in the double digits that MSU scores less than 30 points in this game. They are going to blow Michigan out of the goddamn water. If you look at the SNP Plus matchups for this game, Michigan is the 130th ranked passing offense. Michigan State is the 31st best passing defense. Michigan has the 45th best rushing offense. Michigan State has the 53rd best rush defense. Michigan scores 21.1 points per game, good for 112th in the country. Michigan State allows 20.9 points per game, which is 39th. In terms of total yards, Michigan State is a top 30 
defense. When it comes to the opposite side of the football, Michigan State passes for 233.4 yards per game, which is 67th in the country. Michigan's defense gives up 234.1 yards per game, which is 97th in the country. So every single stat that I've gone through so far has favored Michigan State. Rushing offense for Michigan State. 133.29, that's 90th in the country. Rushing defense for Michigan, 92.14 yards per game allowed. That is 9th in the country. Michigan's run defense is not a top-10 unit in college football. Teams have been up so much that it haven't particularly tried on offense. They haven't needed to. Total, Michigan State is 91st in yards, and Michigan is 34th in yards. Michigan State only scores 21.6 points per game, I will say this, however, which is 110th in the country. Michigan allows 22.1. Somehow, S&P Plus has Michigan as the 24th ranked team overall, the 74th offense, which is ridiculous. They're significantly worse than 74th. This is not a top 100 offense in college football, and a top 10 defense at number 10. And this is not a top 10 defense in college football. Michigan State is the number 72 team in the country with the 101st offense, which Michigan State has a significantly better offense than 101st. They didn't turn the ball over so much. They would be a top 50 offense in college football. And the number 29 defense, which is about accurate in my opinion. This game has blowout written all over. I'm sorry. This just does not seem like a game that Michigan has much of a chance to win in my opinion. But That's just me, and what do I know? I'm just some asshole on the internet giving you his opinion. So at this point, I'd like to remind you to like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see more content like this, and if you disagree with me at any point, go ahead and drop a comment down in the comment section below. And now with the outro done and out of the way, there's only one thing left to say, and that is that I will see you next time.